بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم We are on Surah Al-Qasas which is Surah number 28 and Ayah number 78 أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال إنما أوتيته على علم عندي أولم يعلم أن الله قد أهلك من قبله من القرون من هو أشد منه قوة وأكثر جمعا ولا يسل عن ذنوبهم المجرمون This is the story of Qarun who was from the community of Musa alayhi salam he was one of his own Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Qarun with so much money that the keys to his wealth had to be carried by very strong people and his people who were trained and seasoned by Musa alayhi salam about Allah about the dunya about the akhirah they admonished him and they said to him that he should not seek facade and commotion and corruption through his wealth and he should consider himself fortunate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him this ni'mah. Arun then says, قَالَ إِنَّمَا أُوْتِيتُهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ عِنْدِي that I have been given this because of my knowledge that I have, of knowledge that I possess. Qarun then claimed that God gave him this wealth and fortune because of his own earnings and because of his own skill sets and because of his own effort. And he made his fortune through his own it had nothing to do with direct divine providence. When you own that much wealth, then you claim it's yours. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, or oh, the people of Musa then said to him, does he not know that indeed Allah has destroyed before him many generations who were much more severe than him in uh, power and authority and much wealthier. Yeah. Yeah. Meaning that nations before Qarun and generations before Qarun were much more authoritative and much richer, much wealthier. Who can be wealthier than Qarun as an individual? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says generations of wealthy people. So Allah not only destroyed the individuals who are wealthy, Allah has destroyed generations that were wealthy. Now this destruction may be in the form of a punishment and this destruction may be just normal death. As civilizations, they die also and generations die also. So here we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that yes, you do have wealth and you may have earned it but your ultimate fate is that you will die. وَلَا يُسَلُ عَنْ ذُنُوبِهِ الْمُجْلِمُونَ And then the guilty, they will not be questioned about their sins. Okay? They will not be questioned and he will not be questioned about those who are criminals and those who are guilty. Meaning each one will carry his own burden towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you will not be held responsible accountable for anyone else's uh, burden so here we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us and Qarun that wealth indeed comes from Allah and fortune and power comes from Allah and Allah has the ultimate prerogative to seize someone's life and to capture someone's wealth whenever he chooses to do so. 
that is in the natural and normal realm of cause and effect. People, they are born, they live, and they die. Likewise, generations are born, and they live, and they die. Civilizations are born, they live, and they die. And collectively, these civilizations and these generations had much more wealth and power than Qarun did as an individual. And that is where we stand today. Also, فَخَرَجَ عَلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ فِي زِينَةِ So he came out against his people in his pomp and glamour and glory. فِي زِينَةِ That when you have this much wealth, you want to show off and you want to show what you have built and what you have earned, what you have amassed and accumulated, and then you put on a show. So you have this pageantry. In those days, pageantry, as it is today, was very big. So since he was there in the civilization of the Fir'aun, and he knew how the Fir'aun displayed his wealth and power, so he said, I can mimic him also. So the Qarun also uh, displayed his pomp and his glory with such great pageantry that we cannot begin to describe uh, how he would have done that with the processions, okay, with the, uh, the music, with the horses, or with the camels, and how he put on a show of a banquet and a feast, and all of that. But now he's now showing off his, his wealth to his people, who were basically very poor. The disenfranchised Hebrews of Egypt, which is also very insulting. قَالَ الَّذِينَ يُرِيدُونَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا يَا لَيْتَ لَنَا مِثْلَ مَا أُوْتِيَ قَارُونَ إِنَّهُ لَذُو حَظٍ عَظِيمٍ Those who wanted only the life of this world, they started to remark and observe, if only we were given something similar to what Qarun has been given. We want that. Why? Because indeed he is a man of great fortune. Nabu Haddin Azim. He is someone who has tremendous fortune. This is what people of the dunya say. That the only concern is whether or not we have made it in this world. And how have we made it? If we have made it big, then we are fortunate. And if we are not, we haven't made it big, then we are just normal, average, a stat. So since their only reason for existence was to find glory in this world through wealth, then they said what they said, which is again very common even today. So the Qur'an is now introducing in this surah, which is called the story, another story. So the first story is Musa, and another story is of Qarun. In the story of Musa, Musa is raised in luxury in the palace of Fir'aun, and Qarun acquires his luxury through wealth and good fortune. And the fate of one is this, and the fate of the other is something else. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ وَيْلَكُمْ ثَنَابُ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ لِمَنْ آمَنَ وَعَامِلَ صَالِحًا وَلَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا الصَّابِرُونَ As opposed to those who wanted the dunya, Allah uses a phrase which is very unique. So he doesn't say, those who wanted the akhirah. He does not compare those who wanted the dunya with those who want in the Akhirah. What does Allah say here? وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمِ Those who were given knowledge, knowledge of the unseen, knowledge of what is certain, knowledge of wahi, knowledge of the Nabi, Musa, السلام, and knowledge of the Akhirah, and so on. Those who are given knowledge, are always going to be better 
in those who are given the dunya. As the Prophet ﷺ said that we are the brethren of prophets and anbiya. We do not leave any wealth behind. We are not here to distribute wealth. What we leave is sadaqah. So if anything I leave leaving, meaning dinar and dirham, it will be distributed as sadaqah and charity. I don't leave behind any inheritance in the form of wealth. What we leave behind as prophets is ilm, knowledge. And then he said, whoever receives knowledge will receive a huge fortune. The same words, hadd and azim. Huge fortune. Meaning that inheritance is something that lasts forever. Wealth will never last forever. It will expire when the world comes to an end. Your wealth will expire when you come to an end. The wealth of the dunya will expire when the world comes to an end. But knowledge will continue with you in your grave on the day of judgment and in Jannah. So Allah says that we will just suppose now the dunya not with the akhirah but we will just suppose dunya with ilm, knowledge. Right. And this is how we see the words of the Quran and now saying to the people of Musa uh, testimony to their knowledge uh, that what we have is the knowledge of Nabuwa from Musa Islam. We don't want Qarun's wealth because that wealth is not inherited from Musa. We want Musa's knowledge because we can inherit that from him. Why can't we inherit from Qarun? Number one, he is very proud and arrogant and uh, he's very rude obnoxious and he boasts too much and he doesn't give anybody for the sake of giving. So there's no use in trying to acquire dunya from someone who is this way because he has no ethics, no morals, no behavior. But from Musa a.s. who was raised in luxury, then Allah removed him from luxury and gave him knowledge through Nabuwa, through the Torah. The Torah came later. But through Nabuwa at least then we won't inherit this because this is everlasting and the world is not everlasting and anything in the world is also, also not everlasting. So, Those who were given knowledge, they said. What did they say? وَيْلَكُمْ Woe unto you. ثَوَابُ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ لِمَنْ آمَنُوا عَامِلُوا صَالِحًا the reward of Allah is much better for those who believe and do good deeds. Meaning, yes, if you use your wealth to procure Allah's thawab and you do good deeds, then that is good for you. But if you don't, then you will not do that. You will be in a state of loss, which you always will be. In the linsan al fi khusr, as you know in the Quran. So these people now, they say, وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا الصَّابِرُونَ Except the, 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 the issue with this is that only those who are very persistent and very straight, uh, what do you call it, patient, they are the ones who will be given this. وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا okay? They will obtain this. They will be given this as a fadl from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whether I have wealth or whether I don't have wealth, I will do what I need to do to procure and to earn Allah's reward in this dunya and also in the akhirah, which is much better for those who believe and do good deeds. So in this ayah you see so many teachings of Nabuwa and prophethood which Musa imparted to his people while they were still in Egypt under slavery. Right? And it's fascinating how a human being who is a Nabi will change the mindset of people who are now enslaved in misery in a place and time when they are probably the most wretched of the earth, disenfranchised. How does Nabu change such people? 
How does prophethood change such people? So on one side, someone from their own community made it big. And then those who wanted that, Allah quotes them. And a response to that did not come from Musa. A response from that came from Musa's protégés, his students, his followers, his people. So if this was the response of Musa's people, what do you think the response of Musa is would be? Even more insightful. Even much more wisdom. Even much more, shall we say, potency with regards to Allah and the Akhirah. So what I'm saying is that in this story, the story of the Qur'an, there's so much guidance for us today in the world where we might find ourselves to be downtrodden, disenfranchised, enslaved, and the scum of the earth, the wretched of the earth, uh, all of that. So now we have two groups. One group will say, I want what they want. The American Dream and the MBA. Right? Let's be very frank. Another group will say, no. We want knowledge. Which knowledge? The knowledge that guides us in this poverty and leads us to Jannah. Because knowledge from Nabuwa will guide you in every situation. Whether you are disenfranchised or whether you are glorious. Whether you have the treasures of Qarun, whose keys were lifted by very strong people. Or whether you are the people of Musa who have not been given wealth and you're still enslaved in chains, in slums. Right? So which one do you want to be? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, read the story. The story will fit into your current situation and context also. It will fit like a glove. This is revelation. This is guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't assume that we have not guided you. All you have to do is read the guidance. But your problem is you don't read the guidance. You hear and listen to CNN and you read Time magazine for your world view. And you read this editorial and that editorial okay, for your inquisitive minds. How about reading the Quran? It is the book of guidance. In fact, it is the book, period. Zalikul Kitab. It is the book. In this book, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided all of human beings. So now, in a community where you have filthy rich people, mashallah, and you have very good rich people, mashallah. In the Muslim community, we have filthy rich people who don't care for Allah and His Rasul, and we have good rich people who do care for Allah and His Rasul, and we have people who don't have riches and wealth. What should they do? Each group. Each group should say what this group said. Those who were given knowledge, they have a code. They have a creed. What is their code and creed? That whatever state we are in, we should seek and procure Allah's reward. Salaam So whether it's through wealth or whether it's in poverty, we need to sustain ourselves through Allah's reward. If we are patient, Allah will reward us. If we are grateful, Allah will reward us. If we work together to alleviate our problems, Allah will reward us. If we alleviate our problems, alhamdulillah, and if we don't alleviate our problems, alhamdulillah, we'll be inshallah in Jannah. You have something to look forward to when you die. Right? The problem with the kafir and the atheists is what? They have nothing to look forward to when they die. And the issue with the Muslim is that they want to be like that. Which way? That way. In kufr and atheism, we don't want anything in the grave because we want everything here. So when we don't get everything here, we say Islam is failed us. Why do we say Islam failed us? Because we're not given knowledge. 
if we are given ilm, then we will know Allah has not failed us. And Islam has not failed us because Allah and Islam both promise us Jannah. When we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is why it says, وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا الصَّابِرُونَ Only those who are persistent, resilient and patient will be given this understanding. It's about internal strength. When you, have, when you endure this internal strength, and then you come out into the world, then, mashallah, if you're rich or poor, you are blessed. What are you blessed with? The knowledge that you're going to meet Allah. The knowledge that you're going to meet Rasulullah sallallahu The knowledge that you will be with Rasulullah in Jannah. Ilm. Right? Not how you measure success in the dunya. If you use the dunya as a yardstick for your Islamic success, then you have failed because you're now uh, appropriating Islam with jahl, with ignorance. And that's why Utul Ilm is very intriguing and very necessary for us to understand, internalize, and also promote to other people that it is just not the acquisition of the dunya that Allah wants us to focus on. If that was the case, then what happened to Qarun? So Allah tells us what happened to Qarun. فَخَسَفْنَا بِهِ وَبِدَارِهِ الْأَرْضِ So we caused him and his house and wealth to be what? Swallowed by the earth. It's a long story. According to some riwayat, that Qarun was still uh, passionately jealous of Musa. Musa didn't have any wealth, as you know. He was still there with the Hebrews. And although he went to Fir'aun in his palace, he was not privy to any luxury anymore because he was seen as the enemy. Musa was still in poverty and he was a Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all the people would gather around him to listen to him and Qarun would be there uh, on the periphery, on the fence, observing the authority and the leadership of Musa who was a pauper, ousted from Egypt, ousted from the prison, an outcast, a fugitive, living with this authority amongst his people. And Qarun is looking at him and saying that how come he has authority? I have all the money in the world and I have no authority. Right? So now, it doesn't mean that because you have money you won't be jealous. <laughs> the pride gets to you. Money is not the key. What is the key? Thawab Allah. The Thawab of Allah is the key. Understand? The Thawab of Allah is the key to who you are and what you are. So Qarun could not tolerate this phenomenon that he was seeing day in, day out. In the morning, in the evening, people going to Musa for guidance, for spiritual advice, for counseling, for this and that, for du'as and nasiha. And he could not understand and fathom why someone who is such a poor man would have this much attraction. Why he had this magnetic charisma around him that he pulled everybody and drew everybody into his, his, his audience. So Qarun set out to destroy the reputation of Musa in a very vulgar way. So he appointed and paid somebody to say things against Musa in the open uh, bazaar and market and then Musa now was summoned by his people. Is this accusation true? Musa said, why don't you bring the accuser in front of me? Right? Some slander is an accusation against Musa al-Islam's person and his integrity. And the person who slandered Musa said that this is all false. I was paid off by this person here. Pointing to Qarun. Musa Islam being the man he was, you know, this is not uh, acceptable. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a punishment for this uh, act of Qarun uh, caused the earth to swallow up Qarun with all his wealth uh, as a physical statement of you know, punishment. 
فما كان له من فئته ينصرونه من دون الله so he did not have any army no any group no any henchmen that would be able to help him against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wrath and against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment when you go against the Nabi Allah will punish you either immediately or later on unless you make tawbah okay. so this is the story that is narrated here about Qarun وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُنْتَصِرِينَ nor was he about to be amongst those who are vindicated and who are saved from Allah's wrath and Allah's punishment and a man of hafeeq so now you see the plight of those who only have wealth without knowledge those who have wealth without knowledge of the akhirah they will perish <coughs> either in this dunya or when they go into their graves and on the day of judgment and this is the story those who have Allah's knowledge or knowledge of the Akhirah and of Nabuwa and of the revelation and they act according to that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them the best of both worlds the best being patience and resilience in this world and thawab and reward in the world hereafter sometimes the best is not measured in monetary value it is measured in ethics and morals and good behavior and character and integrity also because that's also a value which is needed in any civilization a civilization that is bereft of tolerance of humility of passion compassion for other human beings welfare is not a blessed civilization okay. so the people of musa said you are an, an anomaly in our society in our community meaning the hebrew community of musa al islam we want people with integrity and people who care for others we don't want people who are selfish and rich we want people who are rich and but generous thinking about others also that's when you know you're blessed if you're not that way then you're not blessed this is the story of qarun Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now takes us through the mindset and the psyche of those who said what they said about Qarun and his wealth if only we had what Qarun had how did they now see this event wa asbaha alladhina tamannaw makanahu bil ams yaquluna wa yaka anna Allah yabsuru rizqa liman yasha'u min ibadihi wa yakhdir lawla amanna Allah alayna lakhasafna bina وَيَكَأَنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الْكَافِرُونَ So those people who yesterday were craving his status and craving to be like Qarun they now woke up in the morning and immediately turned their attention and shifted their focus if not their whole paradigm and their world view towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then they started to say with conviction with conviction yeah. that indeed Allah he will spread his risk and providence to whomever he wants from his servants and he will restrict meaning to whomever he wants so the authority is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the divine prerogative will exercise its prerogative to give this person more and to restrict this person so your millions aren't from what you believe your earnings and your wealth and your power and your education and your connections and contacts in the world or your efforts this is simply from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's prerogative to give you this much because if it was that then how come people who are not warm buffet okay have more than warm buffet in the aforementioned qualities but they're nowhere near him right you know this person has this much and people who are similar to him in education qualification contacts connection they're nowhere near him there's notions of difference between the two so the last prerogative Allah wants to give him this much and this one not so much 
ويخدر. So now he will spread and he will restrict. You can't control the divine prerogative because you're not God. What you can control is your behavior, your mindset, your ethics, your approach, your effort, and whatever you do in the form of halal transactions and earnings. That you can control. That is a blessing in of itself. The result and the conclusion is never in your hands. Otherwise, everyone who has an MBA from this school and college would be filthy rich. But they're not. Some make it, and many fail. Right? That's just normal life in the USA. Not everyone becomes that way. Then you live on debt. The American dream. Right? That's how you live and sustain yourself. So now, who gives? Allah gives. And who restricts? Allah restricts. How do you get to Allah? Through knowledge. Knowledge of what? That the akhirah is better than the dunya. If Allah gives me the dunya, that is a good sign. It's good fortune. If I use it towards procuring Allah thawab, then it's a further blessing. But if I don't use it to procure Allah thawab, then it's not a blessing. It may become a very big curse, as these people now realize. Lawla amman Allah alayna la khasafna bina. Had Allah not favored us, He would have made us uh, be swallowed into the ground also. He would have given us the same fate as Qarun even though we don't have anything. Meaning Allah's favor upon us is that He spares us from self-destruction. Allah's favor upon us is that He has ensured us against poverty in the Akhirah. Allah's favor upon us is that He protects us from bigotry, from arrogance, and from being immoral. That's Allah's favor upon us. And the reason why Allah punished Him was because he was immoral, and he was arrogant, and he was proud, and he did not like Musa alayhi So where, where, when you put all of these now parameters and variables and invariables together, you get a very simple equation. If you believe in Allah, and you worship him, and you follow the Nabi of the time, Allah has blessed you. That's the most fundamental aqeelah for every Muslim to hold. If on top of that, Allah gives you more wealth, then alhamdulillah. And if he gives you enough to live on, alhamdulillah. That is not a sign of God's providence. That is not a sign that God loves you more or less. What you do with it, then that's a sign. If you do things to please Allah more, then that is a sign of Allah's rahmah on you. And if you do things less, um, you do more to displease him, and you do less to please him, then that's not a good sign. So it's who you are and what you are that makes your wealth what it becomes. Your wealth does not make you, you make your wealth. If you are good, your wealth is good. If you are bad and evil, your wealth is bad and evil. It's you. You dictate what your surroundings are. Your surroundings don't dictate what you are. You're not a prisoner of your context. You are a free man. So the people living in the slums of Egypt, under the slavery, enslavement of Fir'aun, they were free people, even though they had nothing. Why were they free? Because Allah's Rahmah is wide and vast and eternal. I can seek and access Allah's Rahmah in any situation that I want to. I don't need a, a members only okay, membership to this club of Allah's Rahmah. It's free. So in the land of the free, you're supposed to be free. I should not be dictated by my circumstances. Circumstances come and go, they change. And just because someone else seems to have a better circumstance, doesn't mean to say that Allah has more favor on him. So this and that. How these people were converted to the people of knowledge. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished Qarun in this story for many reasons. One was his own failure, his own arrogance, and the other was to show people, the people of Musa, that be careful. 
A time will come when you will have the money and wealth that Qarun had. And you must not become like him. Otherwise you will be also drowned, swallowed up by the earth. How is that? That you think of nothing except the dunya and the world and you're consumed by your pursuit of the glory in the world. That is drowning. You've drowned yourself in your pursuit for nothing. If you're a free man, you will live in the freedom of Allah's tawheed. Whichever way Allah wants me, I'm fine. <laughs> Today this way, tomorrow that way. This is how human beings are and that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works and operates. Yes, if Allah gives you a ni'mah, maintain it and make sure that you don't destroy it with your own hands. If Allah has given you wealth and education, money and prestige and honor, maintain it. Don't destroy it. Because then that's on you. That's on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But don't be consumed in such a way that you are swallowed up like Qarun was swallowed up by his pride and his anger against Musa a.s. The truth is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give success to those who are non-believers, disbelievers. Those who do not believe in Allah and in the Rasul of the time, they are non-believers. So Qarun did not believe that uh, he believed Allah existed and he believed Musa was a Nabi. That is not the issue. He did not believe that Allah is the one who gave him all the wealth and he did not believe that Musa السلام, was now eligible for the attention he was given by Allah. Okay. And that spilled over into his people and the people started respect Musa السلام, for Allah for what Allah gave him, not what Firaun deprived him of. That is the story of Qarun in the context of Musa Islam's story. So now, in Musa Islam's story, you have now three, four, five major players, characters. In every story, they have a plot, and you have a list of characters. So the first character is now Musa's mother. So she became part of the story. Then the second character is Fir'aun, obviously, major character in the story. Then the third character is his now father-in-law, and then his uh, wife. They became a character in his story, as we see the story progress. Then Musa a.s. with his brother Harun, they obviously they're the focus of the story. And then the last character is Qarun. So there were those in his family who helped him, like Harun, and there were those in his family who deserted him, like Harun, and there are those with Firaun who helped him, like the wife of Firaun, and there are those with Firaun who deserted him, like Firaun and Haman. So you take your pick. Whichever character you want to describe in this story, the story, you'll find that it is not what you have in terms of the dunya that makes you a good character or a bad character. It is you. Firaun had the world and he said, I am your Lord. He became a bad character. His wife, who was with him, she became a good character. Musa has his mother and sister, they had nothing, and they didn't know what was going to happen. They became very good characters. Musa uh, a.s. Uh, wife and father-in-law, they became exceptionally good characters, even though they were in the desert, they had nothing. Qarun, who was from Musa's people, had wealth, and he became the foe. Allah subhanahu wa says, we made the earth swallow him, as we caused the sea to swallow Firaun. So if you equate uh, success and glory in terms of the dunya, you have failed. And if you equate success and glory with how you see Allah in your life, you have succeeded with Iman. It is not always true that a person who believes in Allah will always be protected by Allah if the person disbelieves in the Nabi. 
Qarun disbelieved in Musa at least in, uh, in the, at the social level, not at the Aqila level, so he failed miserably. And uh, the Fir'aun's wife, who was with the Fir'aun as his confidant his whole life, she succeeded. This is the story. So when, when you want to present characters and a plot and all that good stuff, suspense and mystery and murder, you see this. In these stories, when you want to represent a story and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best storyteller. نَحْنُ نَقُصَّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ We are the ones who are the best storytellers because we narrate the best stories. Right? Now, what the mind of the Prophet ﷺ is hearing and what his heart is now leaning towards is not the story, but the storyteller. This is from who? Allah. Who wrote this story? Allah. So you're mesmerized by the plot, you're mesmerized by the character, you're mesmerized by the intrigue, you're mesmerized by the story, and you worship the storyteller. Right. This is called what? Guidance. This is called Hidayah. If you miss any one of those components, you have not read the story according to guidance. You have read the story according to your own individual context, which is very limited, very confined, and quite frankly, very selfish. So when you want to tell this story to your children, make sure it's the whole thing. Make sure you have the story, the characters, the plot, and the storyteller. Who is the storyteller? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does Allah want you to take from the story? It's right in front of you. It's as clear as day. If you believe in the storyteller. If you believe in the story and not the storyteller, then you're limited in your conclusions. This is why the Quran is inimitable. It is a mu'jiza. That in one very simple story, simple surah of the Quran, which you can very effectively read in less than about 20 minutes, 25 minutes in Arabic, and the translation also in maybe half an hour, you'll get what you need to know about you, your world, your worldview, and your outcome in this world, and your outcome in the other world. That's why it's called the story, Al-Qasas. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us the conclusion to this story, inshallah in the next few passages, next few ayat, which we will discuss when we meet again. Jazakumullah khair. Subhanallah wa hamdi. Subhanakallah wa hamdi. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah.